This was supposed to be a two-hour workshop. Unfortunately, it's only going to be 35 minutes uh, plus five minutes of QA. So I will try my best to teach you all as much networking as I possibly can. My name is Marina Wijay. I am an engineer at a company called Commodore that focuses in on Kubernetes reliability. But you can also find me in and around the community. I talk about things around networking, open source, service mesh, Kubernetes, cloud, and then a bunch of other you know, BS whenever I feel like it, because I also like to talk about other things, too. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn if you want to connect. And I've got a YouTube channel where I tend to dive into some deep technologies, such as Cilium, and even uh, technologies like Tremolo's Open Unison, which is an authentication platform. Uh, but feel free to check it out. I tend to live stream a lot. So we've got a packed agenda. And I'm going to try and get through as much of this as I possibly can. We're going to talk about how you know, communications happen in, in a network. We're going to get into a little bit of what a packet is talk about packet routing, understand why we need DNS, talk a little bit about SDN. DNS stands for Domain Name System. SDN stands for Software Defined Networking. We're going to understand networking namespaces. We're going to try and trace some communications. Actually, we won't because we don't have a lot of time. And then we'll talk a little bit about eBPF. Now, let's get started with the demo. All right. So I've got a little demo environment here. And I'm going to reload my window because I feel like my connection might have timed out. But that's OK. I'm not on conference Wi-Fi. I am on my hotspot. And it will take a second here. But anyways, what I have actually set up here is a Kubernetes cluster. How many of you use Kubernetes today? Oh, excellent, excellent. So I built this in the theme of Kubernetes networking. Not sure what's going on with this little environment. I think it's, it could be my internet connection, but it should be coming up online. But what I have installed is a cluster, a simple kind cluster, which is running in GitHub code spaces. And I've also got the Cilium CNI, a container networking interface. The Cilium CNI is meant to act as our network layer. And it actually provides a variety of networking functions, much like what we would see in the physical network. But to get there, there was a lot of software development that went into this, a lot of SDN, a lot of eBPF magic, and so much more. Now, what I've got here in this little environment is, like I said, Kubernetes, Cilium. And I'm also using a programmatic approach to deploy workloads and policies. So I'm using a tool called Pulumi. Anyone familiar with Pulumi? OK. It's an IAC, Infrastructure as Code tool, that helps you deploy infrastructure and even your applications. So go check it out. But I'm using Pulumi here to bootstrap my environment. So you can even go check this out. I'll show you the, um, the, the QR code so you can even go take a look at it for yourself. Um, but what I want to quickly show you is this cluster. And in this little cluster, tell me if you can see everything here. I'm going to actually close this off here. So let me make the screen nice and big. I have three nodes. These nodes are servers, servers in some data center. Actually, they live on GitHub somewhere. But those servers allow us to run applications. Applications need access to the network. Now, in this nice little Kubernetes environment, a lot of what we normally would do uh, in terms of networking is taken care of for us. So each one of these nodes has an IP address. So I can talk to that IP address. We'll talk about what an IP address is shortly. Um, but on top of those IP addresses, I have more IP addresses or more networks running on top of that. And that is tied to this concept of software-defined networking. Now, I have my base here, which is compute. I have my networking, which if we look at some of our workloads here, and I'm running this command, which just outputs all the different pods in a given namespace called empire. Oh, I have no resources there yet because I haven't deployed my app. But I can actually do something else here, and I'm actually going to show you all, all my applications. And if I actually append an OWIDE, all these applications have IP addresses. So each one of these applications, right, each one of these pods, can communicate with another pod because of that IP address, because of that known address. So if I wanted to communicate with Colleen here in the audience, if I'm not in front of her, I would use a phone number to be able to do that. I'd text her, or I'd call her, or you know, FaceTime her. That's the same idea of using an IP address. 
you have one system that has to make a call to another system. And that address is the destination while the requester or caller has its own address. Now, I want to go ahead and deploy an app here. So the way to go about doing that is I need to go back to my Explorer and I need to go look at my Pulumi source code because in my source code, I actually have an option here to turn on the application that I want. And let's go find that. Deploy Kubernetes resources, deploy demo apps, and then here's the Star Wars app. So the command I'm going to run here is pulumi config. Oop, that was not what I wanted to do. I have a question. Sure. Does this come with, can you turn off the dark mode interface? Oh. You're trying to project black on a white screen. And, and oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I uh, maybe might be able to change that to light mode. Better? OK. Uh, now we have light mode. We could maybe see things a little bit better. OK. So in my configuration here, Pulumi config set Star Wars that enable true. That's just saying I want to deploy the Star Wars application. So I enable it, and then I just have to run this command Pulumi up, and it just redeploys the stack all over again with the Star Wars application. The Star Wars application is three separate workloads or containers that effectively are communicating amongst each other. Um, and what we're attempting to do is implement a firewall. How many of you know what a firewall is? Oh, well, for sure, right? We're going to implement a firewall that prevents the X-Wing from talking to the Death Star. So let's go take a look at our applications. Get pods-n empire. And if we see here, we have two copies of the Death Star. So there are two Death Stars somewhere you know, in the galaxy. We also have a TIE Fighter and an X-Wing. Now, the TIE Fighter and the X-Wing have the ability to land into the Death Star. We obviously do not want the X-Wing to be able to do so. Obviously, because I'm part of the Empire, I do not want to allow this at all. How many of you are familiar with Star Wars, by the way? I'm just, if you're catching the references, I'm sorry. Uh, OK, so we're going to prevent that. And how we go about doing that is by setting a policy. So we'll go back and look at the actual policy. And my intention here is to work backwards so that you can start to see all of this broken down. And we'll, we'll do that. But let's go ahead and implement the policy. And I have to just rerun Pulumi up. Actually, no, before I even do that, how about we test the policy just to make sure that it's all good? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a curl command. How many of you know what the curl command is? Cool. It's a utility to be able to make HTTP calls to an endpoint or a resource, or an API for that matter. In our case, we're just talking to a simple HTTP service. So I'm going to exec into my uh, TIE Fighter. Actually, let me do this. Dash N, Empire, exec. So the exec command. Docker exec, if you're all familiar with that, allows us to get into the instance of a container or running operating system for that matter. Like we would SSH or remote into a system, except now we're actually at the line, line level. So this is like we're in the system itself. So if I run a kube, kubectl n empire exec, uh, let's go to the TIE fighter. Um, and then I'm going to pass some commands into this container. Um, and I'm just going to use the dash s and then curl, and then dash x post, which is just basically posting a message to get some information from the web server. And we're going to call on the Death Star DNS name. So it should be, I think I even have the command here somewhere because sometimes I forget. OK, so it's there. It's Death Star dot M, Death Star dot Empire dot SVC dot cluster dot local v1. Oh, thank you for catching that. That would have thrown me off for like five minutes if I. V1 ship. Oh, no, request landing. Let's see what happens. Oh, that didn't work. Something happened. I'll just copy and paste. It's probably easier. It's always fun trying to do these live demos when your ship is when your uh, 
ship that you're using isn't working the way you want it to. Okay, paste. Okay, we got the TIE Fighter because I didn't use the dash n flag. So because all the resources are in a namespace, we'll talk about namespaces shortly. Okay, so that works. The TIE Fighter works. We can also try the X-Wing. And ship landed means that the request has gone through fine. So we're going to implement a firewall right after this, and we're going to you know, basically block the X-Wing. So I already applied the configuration, so all I really need to do is a Pulumi up, because remember, we did the config, enable that Cilium strict policy. So now it's going to go ahead and deploy the policy. And what we can do is we can even see what that firewall policy looks like. So if I do the kubectl get, or actually, dash n empire get Cilium network policy. I have one. And then I'm going to describe it so that we could just take a look and see what's going on here. So what this policy is doing is it's just basically saying anything, any workload or any resource that has a label associated to it, an attribute. A label is an attribute, something that's telling about that workload or that application. As long as we have a label on it that matches org equals empire, that ship can land. But if we actually take a look at something, if I did a kubectl dash n empire dash uh, or get pods dash dash show labels, if we take a look and see the X-Wing does not have the org empire, meaning it doesn't have that attribute. It doesn't have that label. If we think about firewalls, we will pr create policies based off of either a source or a destination, a port number, um, or an attribute. And in this case, we're using a label as an attribute. And there's a specific reason why we do this, because in the world of Kubernetes, in the world of containers and workloads, we care about immutability, right? We care about resources just suddenly disappearing, and you know, another resource will come and take its place eventually. But we still want to retain things like DNS names, because we don't want that to change. We want workloads to just come and go as they need to. So in this labeling situation, if that X-Wing pod disappeared and we created a new one, that policy should still be in effect. That's, that policy should still work, and that should still prevent the X-Wing from actually landing. And we can go ahead and test that. So I'm going to test the TIE Fighter again, and it works. And we'll go up and test the X-Wing, and it won't work because it's timing out or something's happening on the back end. So that is networking in action. I didn't show you a bunch of IP, well, maybe I showed you a few IP addresses. But the idea is how we got to this point is actually interesting. There's so much work that happened over the course of a decade with respect to networking, maybe even two decades, where software virtualization really created the networking or changed the networking paradigm in certain ways because we couldn't keep pinning our our networking to physical gear. We needed to take some of our physical gear and chop it up into smaller pieces using virtualization. We have to do the same for the network. And that lended itself to where we are today. So back to slides. So you followed along. You can capture that QR code. I'll share that QR code at the very end so that you can also go to the repo and do the exact same thing and even follow the rest of it. But what went on in that little demo is we had workloads that were communicating, and we stopped that communication with the firewall. So how does that happen, right? Every workload that exists today, your phone, your computer, your website, it's generating some level of data. And that data either is stored or sent somewhere. And if it's stored or sent somewhere, or if it's sent somewhere for that matter, we have to find a path for it to go somewhere, to its destination. Now, it's not as easy as, you know, taking a wire and then plugging it into a switch and then you know that's my endpoint and that's how we'll move workloads around or move data around no there is a lot of manipulation that goes on behind the scenes and you know at service providers at our networks at our core networks in our data centers and so we have to get really fancy with how we do our networking and when we think about the actual networking of today right like it's it's interesting i tend to gravitate to what we call the osi model the open systems interconnect model where Let's look at the very bottom. We're thinking about ones and zeros and physical wires that connect into boxes and electrical signals that 
basically come on and go off. And those electrical signals, binary, effectively is our data, is our payload, is our decision making, is our logic for where we get around the network. And as we start to climb up that stack, we build in more intelligence into what, the, what that binary or what those ones and zeros look like. So for example, if I'm sending a message to you somehow, the way I send that message is going to dictate the protocol that I use. Am I gonna use the bird protocol where basically now I'm sending my, my data through a pigeon and it's going to land at, at your place at some point in time, we don't know when, maybe they might get you know, detoured somewhere, or are we gonna use something like TCP or UDP to get us there? Now, these are all protocols that you're probably already using today. You're going to be using them today. You probably SSH into boxes all day long. You probably set or use port 443 to be able to secure your HTTP communications. Um, you probably even leverage a little bit of DNS or a lot of DNS. But the idea is each one of these layers serves its purpose. We talked about the physical layer. We have a data link layer that offers up something called a MAC address that is unique to hardware. So you've got a hardware piece, you've got a laptop, you've got a MacBook. That has a, a very unique address to it. But that unique address is not known by everyone else. And the only way you can make your system known to the rest of the world is by using something called an IP address, which is like that phone number I described earlier on, right? So here's, the, here's inter something interesting. We all have DNA. Uh, and we can't change that DNA, but we can easily change our phone numbers. So you can get a new phone number, and then you can attach a name to that phone number if you wanted to. And now we can route those calls. Now, some of those higher level protocols, TCP and UDP, really help us understand the way we communicate. So you might have seen a bunch of memes with TCP where you know, some person is constantly like sending a message and will wait for a response. And once they get that acknowledgement, then they'll continue to talk. That's called the three-way handshake, right? And the reason why we have that is to basically build resiliency into the way our applications communicate. We want to make sure that the other end is actually there. But in a lot of instances, that kind of communication doesn't always work. Does that work in the sy system or situation of like voice or video or even something like game streaming? Probably not. And that's where UDP communications come in because we just fire away packets or fire away data packets. And why this becomes important is if we sent everything and waited for an acknowledgement, that would actually impact that transaction, that communication, that video stream. If you were live streaming something and you had to wait for an acknowledgement for every frame, we don't want to go there, right? So each one of these protocols has its purpose and sometimes you opt for speed versus reliability in those situations. But there are other ways to handle speed and reliability as well in upper level protocols. Now, most of us are probably already using gRPC or HTTP communications, so I probably don't need to get into that level of detail. But it's the application side that we see that we can interact with. So as that network grows up, there are so many different components and different ways that you can actually slice up your network. You could go the bare metal route and go bare metal all the way or virtualize some of this stuff. Or even go down the realms of container networking and leverage things like a CNI, container networking interface, and a service mesh or, or a distributed app runtime to help with state management um, or even eventing or service invocation. And then when you actually start to see like all the different software pieces that come into the mix, there are so many different components here that interact with each other, that you actually need to run scalable, safe, reliable productions, or sorry, applications in production. You may think you might not need all of this, but you actually do. The reality is like, it takes a long time to build something like this that actually works, that is actually interoperable, that doesn't break when one version of something changes and then it breaks everything else. So, a lot of this actually is dependent on networking too, because if without that networking, without that TCP IP communications behind the scenes, none of this would work. None of these would be able to function. We wouldn't have a platform. So a note on what network platform engineers are, they are network engineers today. So your network engineers will focus on a variety of layers. They'll be at the physical layer, they'll be at the virtual layer, they'll be between the two, and they'll even climb into the container layer or cloud layers. And they'll be working with a variety of systems and configuration methodologies. We could dive into each one of these, like I could spend a lot of time, 
but it gets very complex, but it could also be very simple too. It just depends on the nature of your business, the kinds of applications you run, you know, whether you're running microservices or monoliths, or if you're actually running bare metal systems with you know, Linux running on top of them. It could be anything, right? But it's the system that we're going after is something that is adaptable, that uses APIs to communicate, provides a front end, and then I could programmatically configure my hardware with something like the Magic Packet Pixie. And then from that point, I can start provisioning my operating systems and then layer in configurations for like what that operating system looks like, what virtualization layer it's gonna run, container engine, if it's gonna run an orchestration layer, um, or anything else on top of that. And that's all programmatic. That's where we are today. This is happening today in production. And it's important to know this because if you aren't doing it, check out network automation. And that should give you a lot of insights as to what's going on there. And we could spend a lot of time on all these different configurational files, but I wanna focus on the two bottom layers here because it's like I went, what I just described. We are trying to form policy layers. We're trying to form BGP peer relationships. Who works with BGP today? Oh no, oh, okay, one person works with BGP. BGP is a routing protocol. It helps us connect networks with other networks, as simply put. But it's also a very customizable, influential protocol as well. We could do a lot of things to it to manipulate traffic flows. But here's the interesting thing. We can now programmatically configure this with YAML, or if you want to JSON, or maybe even Pulumi for that matter, and using your favorite language like Python or, or um, TypeScript even, or Go, whatever you want to use, that's where we are. But I think it, it's worth knowing that it gets really complex here, right? So the network actually gets kind of fancy. So let's talk about a packet for a second and what that packet looks like. By the way, I stole this diagram for, from a good friend, Kai from Sivo Cloud. So go check out that QR code if you want to see the full blog post of what a packet looks like. But in a nutshell, a packet is comprised of data, payload data, our information that we want to carry and send from point A to point B. And then in that packet structure, we also have source and destination information, the source address from where it's coming from and where it's going to. If you ever look at a, you know, a letter or an envelope, a letter that you get in the mail, it has two things, your address and the, the sender's address, right? Because we want to know where things are coming from. And that's what's contained in this packet. So we're able to trace communications. We're able to see where this information originated from. But we also have some other information too, like the ability to uh, see if we have other layer protocols inside of this packet header, if we're you know, decrementing something called the time to live so this packet doesn't loop around the network infinitely. I have thoughts about that in ways we can manipulate that too. And then the transport layer that you're using, whether it's UDP or TCP based. So it's going to dictate the kind of protocol that you're actually using. And that's gonna be stored in that packet information too. Now, where does this, or how does this packet actually get constructed? It starts with binary, like I said, which actually gets mapped to uh, a MAC address. That MAC address gets bound to an IP address, which gets bound to a port, right? Whether it's UDP or TCP, to an actual endpoint. Now, when you actually think about that for a second, our packet structure has to start somewhere. It has to start with ones and zeros, and it has to get encapsulated by a MAC address, which has to get encapsulated by an IP address, which has to get encapsulated by the transport layer protocol being used, and then ultimately the application protocol that's being used. That's what's going on here. And simultaneously, as the information or packet arrives at its destination, the reverse happens. Decapsulation goes on. So we're removing all those layers so we can actually get to those ones and zeros and the payload information. So let's follow the packet for a second. Does this work? Cool. So we have a few nodes in our environment. We have a total of five nodes here. And I have a node one to node two communication going on. Simple ICMP ping. Now, let's assume that these two are on the same physical network. What that means is they both know each other or know about each other through a technology called ARP or address resolution protocol through a, a switching fabric of some sorts. Now, that direct connection or that like direct connection means that these two can communicate very easily. Uh, they know about each other, and so communications can happen in a matter of seconds, or sub-second, I should say. But what happens when you actually have to go from node one over to node five, and they're not on the same network? 
this is where routing comes into the mix. And we actually need an intermediary device called a router, which actually acts as the layer two slash layer three boundary, or the MAC address IP address boundary, to carry our packets over to a remote network. So the way this works is node one wants to talk to node five, but only knows about node one, two, and three. It doesn't know about node four and five. It just knows it wants to go there. The only person that knows about it is the router. So it's going to say, hey, router, I need to go to some destination, which I don't know about. Can you take me there? And the router will be like, you know, I might be able to take you there. And so it takes you all the way to node five, and then the reverse happens because the router knows about that network and can do the same for that node over there. That's basic communications. That's what's going on. Now, oh, I had an animation and it didn't work. Anyways, it gets complex because if you've ever worked in a data center, you might have racked and stacked some stuff like I have and then probably had hearing loss working in a data center because of all those fans and uh, whatever noise going off. But then you start to scale horizontally with your physical servers. Scale horizontally. Sound familiar? We do that in Kubernetes. We scale our workloads horizontally, right? So, well, we also scale our data centers horizontally because guess what? The cloud is not infinite. We have to still buy hardware. We still have to put that hardware somewhere. We have to power it on, make sure we have the right cooling and uh, ventilation in place, and we have to give it network access. But to give it network access, we can't just simply drop it on the network. There's some negotiation that has to go on here. We have negotiation going on between bare metal and Kubernetes so that servers or workloads right in here, in this little environment, can talk to what's over here in my Kubernetes-backed environment. And then if we, if we zoom out, it gets even more complex because we could have cloud environments that are based on Azure or Red Hat OpenShift or Kubernetes. Um, you, I mean, you might be running Red Hat OpenShift on Amazon, so Rosa, if you're familiar with that. Or you might be even running VMC somewhere, VMC, VMware Cloud on AWS or VMware Cloud on, on Google. And sometimes the routing, the network connectivity gets a little wonky because the way Azure does networking is different than the way AWS does networking, is different than the way GCP does networking. And there is no common denominator other than things like IP addresses and maybe BGP for that matter, and then protocols like IPsec, which provides you know, tunneling or, IP or VPN capabilities. Now, we could get even more fancier and start to see that BGP does do a lot of YAML stuff as well, but we won't get into that. But I want to talk about DNS for a second because that's another critical thing. You know, I've talked about IP addresses and how addresses or devices have these addresses and can communicate with each other. Except we don't want to memorize, we, we don't want to memorize this. We don't want to memorize these fine details. We only want to memorize Commodore.com or Google.com or whatever. Now, I'm using the command called dig. Dig is a is a tool that you can use at the command line that helps you do lookups for various servers or services to see if they're going to return um, a bunch of IP addresses or IPv6 addresses. What's interesting is you've got an A record, you've got a PTR record, a C name, and Route 53. Route 53 is a service that AWS offers where you can do a lot of DNS stuff. A records just allow you to take your IP addresses and associate host names to them. PTR records do the reverse, and C names just give you another name for those A records as well. So you could have secondary names as well. Now, why this is important is when we take this to cloud or we take this to Kubernetes, everything is reliant on DNS. If, if DNS isn't present, things tend to break very, very quickly. Without a lookup service, without the ability to look up names and translate them into IP addresses, because if we don't translate them into IP addresses, we don't know how to route to them. If we can't route to them, we can't get to them. Uh, we're not going to be able to communicate with our endpoint. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg situation. You need DNS, but you also need IP addressing and IP reachability to get to your DNS server, which is, you know, in a, in, interestingly enough, has been the cause of a lot of outages out there, public ones too. Now, what about SDN or software-defined networking? Software-defined networking allows us to manipulate the network and oversubscribe it, actually. 
much like we did with servers, right? We took servers and we added a hypervisor on top. How many know what a hypervisor is? Nice. So we've got hypervisor on top and now we can start carving out smaller virtual machines on top of these servers. We're doing the same thing with the network. The difference is I'm not going into my physical switch and carving out the switch in, in some ways. That's another terminology and it's called VLANs. We're not gonna talk about that today. It's just a way to carve out your broadcast domains. But VXLANs and Geneve, these are protocols that allow you to create layer two domains or these networks on top of networks. So remember, these, these two networks right here, one, two, they're, they're remote, they're isolated from each other. They're not in the same data center. You can pretend that one is here in Seattle and the other one is in Toronto where I live. And through, this, you know, through these communications, I'm actually creating another network layer, a Geneva or a VXLAN layer that actually creates something called an IP subnet. An IP subnet is just a way to group a bunch of addresses and also find a way to get to them so I can route to them and know maybe where my endpoint destination is. And that's tied to something called a routing table as well. IP addressing, I could spend like three hours on if you wanted me to, but we only have another nine minutes left, unfortunately. So with SDN, I'm able to now create networks that span the globe. And you might wonder why we even did this. So it has a lot to do with the fact that sometimes as engineers, we tend to make things very static, like databases and some applications that are hard-coded hard with IP addresses and that created a dependency on the network. We needed to make sure that that layer two broadcast domain or that subnet was always available. So VXLAN kind of solved that problem. It also solved a bunch of other problems too, like being able to achieve disaster recovery so I didn't have to sit there and re-IP all my workloads. If you wanna talk more about that, we could talk more about that all day long because I love disaster recovery. So HTTP, I know you're all familiar with it, but I highly recommend you go check out Mozilla's page on HTTP status codes uh, because there are five different kinds. The one I'm showing you right now is a, a request, right? A request to a service. Uh, go check out the QR code. There's a full document on HTTP status codes and the types of errors you'll run into. But it's just telling us the version of protocol that we're using and whether or not that request went through. And why this is important is if I did a standard ping with IP addresses, getting an ICMP reply doesn't tell me much. It just means that that service is reachable. It doesn't tell me the application is actually gonna give me the data that I want. And HTTP as a protocol does that for us. So go take a look at that blog post. Networking namespaces, okay. So this is, this is where we're starting to get closer to what a CNI is and all that Kubernetes networking. So I talked about software-defined networking. Networking namespaces is a form of that. I'm actually creating these small isolated network boundaries that hold processes that could either be their own networks or they could be networks that are attached to other network namespaces. So in this situation, in this little instance, I've got two network namespaces. One is called the web app network namespace and then another one is called the sleep namespace. But if you notice here, right, their addresses is 192.168.52.2 slash 24 and then 52.1 slash 24. That slash 24 tells me that these two are in the same IP subnet. That slash 24 dictates how big that subnet is or how many addresses or how many hosts can go into that. That's all IP subnetting. Like I said, three hours. If you want, I could sit down with you and we'll go through that, but I'm not, not gonna do that right now. Uh, and then they both have a default gateway to get outbound. So that default gateway is that router. Remember that diagram of that router that I showed you earlier on? That's the default gateway. It's going to take me where I want to go, which is essentially where these network namespaces want to go. Not to each other, they want to go outbound, outside of this host, because we're looking at a Linux host. Now, in order to replicate a switch, or a local area network, or a broadcast domain, I have to create a bridge. And that bridge is also going to be a part of the same subnet because it becomes the exit point by which these two network namespaces or where these services live can, can get out to the outside world or out to another um, network or another host with where the destination workload they're trying to get to lives on. So you would see a, an exact replica of this setup on another node in a Kubernetes environment because a CNI is powering all of this. Now, what is going on here, right? Um, if you actually went to this QR code, you can actually construct the, the network names. Why is this video not playing? Will it play? Maybe it'll play. It'll be really fast. 
But actually, the whole point of it is it constructs a network namespace for you, and you construct another one, and you're able to do IP reachability between those two network namespaces. Now, here's the thing. Remember containers come and go, or pods come and go? A pod in Kubernetes is a network namespace. Now, if that network namespace has to disappear, are you going to sit there and re reverse that process manually? If that pod has to disappear, are you going to reverse that process manually? Absolutely not. That's what a CNI is doing for you. It automates the onboarding of a container into a pod or a network namespace, attaches it onto the network, and effectively gives it the network access it needs. And then when that pod has to go, it does the reverse. And it also offers up IP address management as well. So it can track when that pod gets an IP and when it disappears. So having said that, right, um, network namespaces are a fun thing to do, but they all live in the world of container networking interfaces, so we don't have to sit there and build them out. Now, there are three ways to trace what's going on in our network. There's actually plenty more, but I'm going to talk about three core ones. If you have physical devices amongst yourself, specifically like HPE, Dell switches, Cisco even, uh, you could use something called LLDP or CDP to be able to trace your hardware-to-hardware -hardware connectivity. Now, that's not going to be extremely valuable, but it could actually help you in a lot of ways to help you see if there's a break in communication somewhere or if you are seeing slowness physically on the network. There are a couple of other tools, Wireshark and Kubeshark. Wireshark actually gives you some really deep details around communications, right? If you're talking about point A to point B, you're not only going to see the packet flow, you're going to see the source and destination, you're going to see a whole bunch of checksum information, you're going to see, if it's not encrypted, even the payload data. If it's very plain text at, or, or ASCII even, you could see all of that data pretty easily without issue. And that's actually pretty important because when you're trying to troubleshoot a networking issue, Wireshark is actually very powerful. A packet capture paired with something like you know, ChatGPT um, will help you discern what's breaking or what's broken in your network if you tap the right part of your network as well. And then there's tracing. So we can follow the flows of our HTTP, or sorry, our you know, IP communications, but tracing actually helps us follow our requests, especially if we have multiple requests in a path, right? Because look, I'm not going from point A to point B. I'm going from point A to point B to point C to point D to point E to get that answer at times. And sometimes tracing with the right instrumentation can tell us how things are moving about in the network. That brings us to eBPF. I have a couple more minutes left, so let's be quick. eBPF is a kernel space system that allows us to create sandbox-based programs that are verified to not crash the kernel. They're sandboxed, they're isolated, they can still interact with the kernel, they can capture data from the kernel, and they can feed that up into user space applications. An example of this is the Cilium CNI. It's effectively looking at event information at the kernel level, whenever there's TCP communications going on. It's seeing that, and then it's going to translate that up into user space activity. And we decide if we want to take action on that activity, right? And we could do that right at the kernel level versus doing this in user space. So in user space, we actually have to depend on the Linux kernel to send up information into our operating system. And then we decide how we want to act on that with another user space ap application. In the case of eBPF, what we're actually doing is we're using those kernel hooks and trace points with something called k-probes or probes. And then we're attaching this and adding that data into a map either a ring buffer or a hash map, and then reading that data in user space real time. And that's allowing us to make decisions on the fly. eBPF can allow us to um, make policy decisions or firewalling decisions at the kernel level faster than a user space application can, and also helps us with packet level decision making as well. So that brings us to the end. I am right on time. That is Network Foundations in 40 minutes. I will open up the floor to questions. Any questions? No questions. OK. Yes, one question. What's your favorite Star Wars ship? <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know. That's, that's a bad question to ask, because I don't have a favorite. Um, by the way, OK, Millennium. Oh, I guess. Any other questions? Yes?
Yes, so there's actually a few tools that actually do this for you. You can either use um, Hubble. Hubble is a Cilium-based tool that allows you to actually trace eBPF communications at the node level. Um, Commodore, the company I work for, has a, a network dependency mapper built into its platform that shows you TCP IP communications between pods as well, so you can track the flow as well. If you're looking for this at a, an HTTP level, there are tools like Jaeger that helps you understand like spans and traces, or you could use something like Kiali, which helps you visualize your HTTP communications as well. Yes? Uh, depends on, so the question is, are there tools out there that help with UDP flows? So it depends on what kind of UDP flows you're after. Because the, the reality is you actually need something to send that or like have a receiver somewhere to be able to capture that data or that telemetry data and then feed it somewhere else. Um, the closest tool I can think of right now is iPerf and JPerf that tests like UDP and TCP based like bandwidth performance. But I also don't know what you're trying to test. So maybe we should take that you know, just offline and chat more. Any other questions? Yes? So go back to the beginning when you were talking about the first and third flows. Um, is that something that you like plan and plan, plan and apply those flows like once or like on an ongoing basis? You know, it's funny. Networks are ever changing but also very static at the same time. A lot of the lower level stuff is very static and, and we also don't want a lot of the intel intelligence living there. For example, at the hardware level, we want packets to move very quickly, and we don't have to think about that. Where the decisions should be made are at our application layer, or at a firewall layer, or at an SDN layer, or a virtualization layer. And the reason why that is is because we can make, it, uh, make use of all available circuits in like a data center environment, um, meaning I don't have any standby links. If I have you know, four 100 gig links, I don't want any of them to sit idly because they're expensive, but that means I get 400 gigs of bandwidth to use for things like storage replication or being able to just you know, address latency concerns, which is almost never a concern in the data center. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for coming by. I appreciate it.